about to uh, talk to one of our longtime friends of our show, Joe Kelly Radio. He has been the drummer with Soul Asylum for, I think, close to 17 years. He also was uh, the longest recording and member of Prince and the New Power Generation all through the years. And he is a world-class, legendary drummer and musician, a great guy, too. We welcome all the way from Minneapolis, Mr. Michael Bland. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing all right, man. I just had to turn my phone off. Somebody was blowing me up. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, are you all set? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so so you're, you're back in hurry up and wait mode, right? As, as uh, <clears throat> Soul Asylum. Uh, <laughs> how, yeah. how, you been dealing, how you been dealing with it the last last past year? Um, I, I think... Uh, I've been taking it in stride. I'm, you know, because um, my job is a sort of forced socialization, I really do appreciate time by myself. I didn't need this much, but, right, right. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's led me to some, uh, a lot of self-reflection and, um, you know, the, the, the contemplation of diversifying you know, my my role in the music business and maybe, you know, I've thought about a lot of things. I've thought about teaching. I've thought about doing webinars. I've thought about a lot of stuff that I haven't actually um, put into motion just yet. But um, I see the necessity of, uh, of diversification m much more clearly now than I ever have. Um, yeah, yeah, right. And of course, some of the things you mentioned, I mean, you, you'd be pretty much in demand webinars and, you know, master classes be right up your alley people will be going for that yeah i mean i i'd like to imagine i mean there's only one way to find out obviously um, right right but uh yeah so it's been you know, a lot of self discovery and a lot of uh, analysis and and a, a whole lot of um musical output i mean i've been doing a lot of writing and recording um collaboration o over you know over zoom uh right. you know skype or facetime or you know whatever uh platform you know works for some people um so it hasn't really slowed me down it just forced me into a different space i um uh, i taught myself um how to run uh pro logic 10 like oh, that's one of the wow. first things that I did when I got off the road because Soul Asylum was on the road until uh, March 12th last year. We had, yeah, we, we left on like the 9th or the 10th. We left Minnesota on a, on a Prevo, on, on a tour bus. And okay. our last gig was at the Terragram Ballroom in Los Angeles. Great gig. End of the right. night. I, I into the night I hear the owner talking to the staff saying something about our capacity is going to be shut down to half. And uh, that, like he's, we've been living on this tube, you know, <laughs> and yeah, right. a lot of the time our satellite wasn't working. So I, I, we, I personally was not aware that this was turning into a pandemic. I had heard some, you know, some smatterings here and there, you know, whatever I could glean whenever I had MSNBC on. But a lot of the time, I didn't, I I, I, I just didn't know what was going on. And it, it really came to a head when we got to San Diego in the morning and all of the remaining gigs of the tour had been canceled or rescheduled for next year. Oh, and, how much of a gut punch is that? Well, that's that's something, especially when you're, you know, you're supposed to be playing the belly up, you know, tavern. <laughs> that night and you can't even get in the building so it's yeah. just like whoa okay this thing is serious and yeah, um, I, I kind of uh knew was going on because my brother was managing a hotel out in uh beijing and he flew back to right around that time to california he was able to get back in the country with him and his wife mm -hmm. and they went to las vegas and quarantined for like three weeks in the back they had a little house in the back and he, he's not going back so well i mean yeah it's deep you know right. it's uh and a lot of countries have gone through this before but the first time around with you know 
right. with yeah. the United States. It's uh, <laughs> and you know we there's there's a culture of what do they call it rugged individualism, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and that, that's basically what's been holding up you know uh, a, a lot of the progress. You know, the, these are the people who don't want to wear masks. They don't want a social distance. They want to. In my case, these are the people who want to go cross the river or go to Wisconsin and party down. And yeah. you know, come back infecting the rest of us. So right. <laughs> you know, I, I I see people you know out, out of my master bedroom window, you know, just walking and talking like nothing's going on out there. Wow, it's a uh, so I mean it is what it is, but it just you know, we forget that America is a young child, mm -hmm. you know, right. and it has tantrums and I won't do it, won't do it. And there's a lot of that. You know, and um, a, fr a friend of mine who lives in Wisconsin, uh, who actually had a, I had a um, a little little podcast type jam with him called Music, Music Politics. His name is Dan Smithy Newman. And uh, 37 years old, uh, you know, for only person I, I knew at the time who caught COVID and had to, he had to go on a ventilator for wow. For he was in the hospital for 23 days. 11 of them he spent on a ventilator. Before they put him under, he had to say goodbye to his wife in the event that he wouldn't come out. You know, it's like it's people don't realize how deep it can get. You know, and unfortunately, uh, uh, last night I was up last night. I got an appointment for my wife and I. Saturday we're going to get the vaccine. So, oh, right on, man. That was good. Yeah, but it's like you're it's like you're staking out Ticketmaster online trying to get concert tickets. <laughs> and he, after a while, you're so wired, you're just like, you know, take you to four o'clock to fall asleep. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, it's um. How, how about it's, out your way with the vaccine? Are you guys any close to getting it? I mean, actually, I mean, just before, um, like a little bit ago, uh, one of my, a person that my wife is uh, working with, um, who's a, uh, a kind of an important person in the world of diversity and inclusion apparently they um they gave her a, a list of uh she get 100 people vaccinated oh, and uh wow. and so my wife just told me just told me this morning that uh we may be able to be on that list so hey so so a glimmer of hope for everybody that's cool yeah I, yeah i mean you know i'm as as a black person i still have my you know <laughs> my yeah, skepticism yeah, because history, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's, it's hard to erase that, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to take it seriously, and I, you know, I, I imagine that I will just go along with it if we can do it, right, but, um, right. you know, it's a, uh, that's that that's a, uh, I'm, I, it's not going to be easy for me in my brain, right? Yeah, but uh, I mean, also, you know, all a bad news travels fast. You hear about all the different incidences where people got it and something went wrong, and we. You know, it, it's 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 a yeah, it's a trial and error thing. It's a trial and error thing, man. We guinea pigs, Joe, and you know, <laughs> right, I right. understand that you know it's better to have it, you know, than to die than than to die for sure. Or, but I, I mean, either way, you're taking a risk. So yeah, my my uncle's a retired uh, internist, and he he always used to say. They call it medical practice for a reason because a lot of times they're practicing. Yeah, um, and I, I get it. You know, there's, there's uh, with every movement forward, you know, the some people, you know, there's there's always a sacrifice somewhere. Right. You right. know, and I, I don't think of myself necessarily in that res respect or regard. You know, I don't I don't expect to lose my life getting a vaccine, but. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's a lot of factors that we can't control. And, um, uh, you know, especially in the business that I'm in, if I'm going to return to the, t to the touring world when it's supposed to be, you know, when it starts to open up, you know, I I'm going to need some sor sort of uh, some form of pr protection. So, yeah, because you're, you're, you're in the midst of who knows what. You know, uh, yeah. Can, you know, and we have, headquarters. yeah, we got, Potential dates in June as coming up as early as June. Outdoor shows, yeah, outdoor shows, and um, you know, so it's uh, it could be timely, 
you know, I, I, it's I, I imagine for the for for the for the general welfare of those who who uh, I'm around, the the best idea is to just go ahead and get the shot if I can get it. So. So my special guest right now, he's been on the show numerous times. Great guy, Mr. Michael Bland out of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And uh, he's taking a little break for us because of our COVID <laughs> soul, soul asylum. And 17 years, I wasn't wrong on that, right? Uh, it, it, well, it, either I kind of, uh, we started working together in 04, sometime between 04 and 05. Uh, okay. I, I got, I was in, in. You know, so I guess it's how how many years is that? <laughs> yeah, sixteen or so. Seven. Yeah, seven yeah. Seven okay. So. Yeah. So, so well, mm -hmm. everybody, we all know we first became familiar with working with Princeton, the New Power Generation. Of course, that was a long, long stretch, and you know, you got back together recording and doing some live gigs with them years after that. But to commit yourself to a, a band right now, you you're a member of Soul Asylum for so long. In your mind, what did, did you make that decision? Like, hey, this is where I'm going to stay right now for a while. Uh, yeah, I, I did. Um, I found during the years in between when I was working for Prince and when I joined Soul Asylum, uh, I had a lot of great adventures. I did a lot of work overseas. I um, I, I toured with, with, with some name artists. And um, I think the thing that I found uh was that i get better results working with people who are from where i'm from okay um there's a certain kind of uh, work ethic that that goes on here that's not uh it's colloquial i don't i haven't found it anywhere else in in, in the country and, and and uh usually w when it is working it's because i've <laughs> I uh, transplanted musicians who I, you know, who I'm familiar with into positions that uh, th that I have the uh, wherewithal or the authority to. Um, the first thing that I did, Sonny and I were called to sub for a different rhythm section with this Italian artist in '97. Her name is Georgia. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, they wanted a bass player and a drummer who, you know, were used to working with each other, who developed a, uh, you know, a rapport and whatnot. Um, so um, we got the call and we went out there and uh, it turned into a regular gig for us. So the, the next thing I know, I made the musical director. So <laughs> the, the, first, the first thing I do when it's time to switch up guitar players and keyboard players is <laughs> is call Tommy Barbarella and Mike Scott. Oh, so wow. the four of us are over there together, you know, just just killing it cuz we all came we all fought the same war, trained in yeah. the same army. So, you know, it it was a uh, the band was incredible. Uh and I guess I've had enough varied experience with people from other parts of the of the country, and, and in the world, to to know that nobody does what we do, like nobody does it like like Minneapolis musicians do it. It's a, there's a different co co connection to the process. I'm not sure if it's uh, geographical or because we get seven months of winter every year, or you know where it forces you to really hone your craft. And, you know, I, I, most of the songwriters that I know, uh, Paul Westerberg, Dave Perner, it, Prince, these are people who, who uh, write or wrote at uh, a pathological level. Like it's, uh, like it's what they do. Perner, we're working on a new record right now with Soul Asylum. Um, okay. Yeah. Dave texted me at six thirty in the morning <laughs> to talk oh. about Led Zeppelin for a minute. Like he has, he's he he, he doesn't sleep too well anyway, uh -huh. but he's really you know, he's uh, he's always at it. It's always happening. You know. You guys are rich and to get back together, and go back on the road and, and finish this 
um, it's going to be the follow-up to uh, Hurry Up and Wait, right? Uh, well, we, we can only hope. Uh, yeah. our, our label is is our, our really um, is who's putting the pressure on. Like, hey, if you guys come out, you know, got something, we're ready to put it out. Everybody's looking for a little, you know, a little action, a little reason to keep moving forward. Right, right. So if we can provide that, that's great. You know, I mean, Hurry Up and Wait is the is the best selling album Soul, Asy- Soul Asylum has had since since the nineties. So it, it 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 was not a, a small deal. It was it was a it was a big you know victory for the band. And then COVID comes along and cuts that tour short and you know and dashes the hopes of anybody doing anything for a year. <laughs> so you know, well, at least the, the the demand for for fan base is, is still strong as ever. So that's exactly. So at that, least we, know we have some. Yeah, we have something to get out there for. Right. You know? Right. And it, it, it's uh, so the the best we can hope for is uh, you know, a, a warm reception, you know, uh, and um, and continued success. Really, I mean, that's what it's all about for us at this point is proving that you know you can still you know be relevant. And produce a a viable and competitive result in this day and age. You know we're battling, you know, fifteen year olds. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah. but if you come yeah. to one of our shows, you you know it's you know we we do what we do, uh, Joe. It's a rugby fight on that stage. Right, right. You know? And and you played. Uh, I, I haven't been able to make it, but you've come to Connecticut a few times and played the Wolf Den, right, at the casino. Yeah, I I missed the last couple of Wolf Den gigs, but um, oh, okay. it's, well, it's gen- before, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right. yeah. So, and what ended up happening was Sterling Campbell, uh, the drummer from like the Grave Dancers Union, uh, oh, okay. period, and Let Your Dim Light Shine. Like he was basically he took over in like ninety four ninety five, and stayed with the band till he joined David Bowie's band, I think, in like uh, two thousand or so. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. But uh, so Sterling lives in New York, so he would just, you know, either take the train or, you know, like drive up to the Wolf Den and, and cover. He covered those shows. Oh, OK, cool. So, that, so you know, then the fans get a, a special treat because, you know, they he was in all the videos and whatnot. So they know him. And, and you know, it's a homecoming. But, uh, yeah, it's a nice, nice little spot. Yeah, nice little thing for him to do. He doesn't have to go far from home, right? You know? And because uh, I think he's he's the musical director for the B fifty twos, so oh okay, he he works plenty. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So well, Michael we, Bland is here. Oh, go ahead, Mike. No, no, go ahead, man. Go ahead. Do, no, do, I, was, do. I was gonna say we're talking with Michael Bland here on Joe Kelly Radio and reminiscing uh, about about some of the other stuff with uh, Soul Asylum. Um, you know. We had a good buddy of yours, Dave, Dave Hanania, on uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And I guess we could seg right into the early days when you were a, a teenager and Prince finding out about you because Dave Hanania, he, he's told this story several times and probably to you, but he felt it was the best six bucks he spent to be able to see you twice a week playing with Mambo's Combo. <laughs> and, I mean, he he is forever indebted to you. He's just, you know... It's great to see that admiration between these musicians. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I and that that's I I I get it, and and it's a, uh, you know, I was happy to be a resource to the community in that respect. But the reality is that Dave Anania always had he was always a, a gifted drummer. He didn't really oh, yeah. need, need me to bring that out. I, I guess whatever I did for him, only he can say. But he would have been perfectly fine, I'm sure, if he if oh, he, yeah. he would have got it, it from has. somebody else if he didn't get it from me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he, he's a great player. Yeah, great guy too. So, uh-huh. you know that that time was around the time Prince was, uh, as he's known to do in the past, go out to the clubs, see what's the local talent, and maybe say, "Hmm, can they hang with me and, uh, you know, jam with me?" What What was it like those early days, and how how did you get hooked up with Prince? Wow. Well, um, I mean, th- how can I condense this story? I guess I I. I to tell the important parts. Okay. Uh, I was I was playing with the combo, but they had taken uh, a Wednesday night regular gig at, at, a, at another club other than playing at Bunkers on Monday. So um, 
I was double booked. I had a gig at the Whiskey Junction with a, a different band entirely. So when Prince happened to walk into the fine line and see the combo, he saw them without me. But he recognized Margaret Cox from her work with Jesse Johnson doing Tamara and the Scene and whatnot. Right. And uh, so they got talking, and I guess he was like, well, you know, it's loud in here. Can we, you know, can you, can, can you join me in my limo for a minute? So he took her out to the limo, and he's like, it's a, it, you guys are really good. That's a great band. And she was like, oh, you ought to hear us with our, our normal, our regular drummer. He's, a, he's this kid. He grew up over southeast Minneapolis like me, and he's, 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 he's a really good drummer. And, I, and she piqued Prince's interest. So he shows up the following Monday, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, you know, kind of, you know, eyeballs the band and is checking things out and uh, comes up to sit in. And um, I think that he more or less uh, felt my potential uh, immediately because uh, that led to a series of um, uh, invitations out to Paisley Park to, um, you know, he would have parties out there on, on a pretty regular basis. And uh, also um, invited us out there to hear some unreleased material. I think the Batman record was just coming out. And... Okay. Uh, I, I, Bat Dance had been out, had already been number one and whatnot. And uh, he invited us out after the gig one week to uh, to come hear, you know, the record in, in its entirety before it came out. And uh, that led to uh, playing some 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 music from uh, Graffiti Bridge. And then he um, ended up working with Margaret in the studio. So we all got a chance to contribute in that respect. Um, and it all kind of just led to, you know, uh, a, a uh, an official job offer. Now your your first tour with him was the new tour, right? Yes. Uh huh. Which uh, it was it was a, yeah Japan. There's a really I mean you've probably seen this a million times, but a really cool overhead shot of you playing drums. Oh yeah, the um when we I think that was from the Tokyo Party Man, game. right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. So you, the drum drum set up there, Prince allowed you pretty much to. To get what you wanted, to make it that elaborate. I mean, you had a lot of drums. In your uh, well, you know, I ordinarily probably wouldn't have gone that far with it. He kind of he, he pushed me in that direction. Uh, okay. I, and in the video for Party Man, I had like a thirty-two inch kick drum, and he was like, you know, when it came time to get a new kit for the, for the tour, he was like, um, you know, you should make sure you you know you get a big kick, like you know, like we had in the video. And, right. you know, like, you know, just like, you know, get get an impressive looking kit. So, I, I mean, yeah, that was that kick drum <laughs> on the new tour was a 26. And wow. then I, it was a, a Yamaha um, recording custom uh, with custom. Uh, they actually uh, custom. They did the uh, the hardware in some kind of uh, gold plating or something. Like it was, it was a custom job, like a custom, custom job. Uh, 26 inch kick. The toms were 12, 13, 15, <laughs> and then wow. two floor toms, 16 and 18. And then just, you know, I mean, whatever Zildjian was the first company to really openly, you know, embrace extending, you know, they, they extended a, um, an endorsement deal right away. Uh, oh, Yamaha. Wow was uh, I didn't get to be endorsed by Yamaha until actually like 97 or 98 after I had done my run with Prince um, okay. because they really wanted their name on the, you know, the front of the, the kick drum head and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of them, you know, a lot of companies are like that. And right. I, I, I told the rep that I spoke to, I'm like, well, she lives with Yamaha and, you know, she didn't do that. And they were like, well... <laughs> Our relationship with the Escovedo family has gone oh. on for many years. <laughs> and, you know, so wow. they gave me that. And I'm like, okay, I see. So the next time, it, you know, it was time to update, I went to Sonar. I, oh, I okay. moved to a different yeah, you, company. I'm like, okay. Well, a lesson. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, I see how it is. I don't, I don't right. have to play Yamaha. There are right. other companies out there that are happy to, you know, and, and so I took advantage of that. And um, basically... There's a, a guy they call Hagi. Hagi was um, 
uh, 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 high up at Yamaha in Japan. And basically, once he heard that I was free and uh, and and out of that camp, he sent someone to contact me to say that they wanted me. And uh, to this day, I'm, I'm forever grateful to Hagi because um, I, I, the first thing I said was, "Well, I'm not with Prince anymore." And they said, "Well, Hagi says he doesn't care. You're oh, a great, okay. you're a great musician, so right. you're bound to, you know." continue to work with great artists. It wasn't a question for Hagi. And uh, I, don't, I never got to meet Hagi in person. He, I mean, he's still alive. Uh, you know, we'll chit chat sometimes on, on Facebook and whatnot. But um, yeah, he, 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 he uh, that's a, a debt I could never repay, you know. Yeah, um, Michael Bland is here, drummer extraordinaire, <laughs> Prince in the new power generation and currently 17 years going on more for soul asylum of course he still makes his home out in minneapolis st paul area and you know we're talking about the prince tours that that you toured with him and rehearsals were they all the same the rehearsals as grueling or did they kind of lessen up as as prince got older and you know you guys jammed together for so long no 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 <laughs> okay they, they what was the most grueling up. one they didn't lighten up they tightened up especially when the band got kind of whittled down to the the four of us and Maite when it was right, just right. Mr. Hayes, Barbarella, Sonny, and me. That right. meant you could get people together more quickly, you know, and, and on a more frequent basis. So, you know, and in many ways, we missed Levi and Rosie and Tony and Damon and Kirk because it was a you know we had more time away then. I got you, but. It was. It got to the point where it was like we were living at Paisley Park. How about how about the Glam Slam shows out in Florida? He was he was mixing the sound on stage, right? I think that was the first time he experimented with that. Yes. Yeah. In, in public, how, anyway. How about for you? Did it affect you? Your playing, or was it difficult? Um, he was not so much mixing the monitors. He was mixing oh, the front okay. of the house. <laughs> oh, okay. I got you. Yeah, which actually it would have been you know better for the audience if it had been the other way around. Right, right. It was hit or miss. Uh, I mean, he wasn't the first person to actually try that, you know. But um, the thing, the the most incredible thing about Prince was that he wasn't afraid to try anything, you know. And that's also the curse is that, you know, is that if you don't, when you rely on your personal ingenuity uh, viewpoint, and intellectualism, uh, you know, for the choices that you make, like Prince was very much the type of guy who uh, I have recently heard an interview that um, my friend Audrey Johnson did of uh, of Dave Hampton and Susan Rogers, and okay. yeah, Dave Hampton sure. was talking about how you couldn't just say no to Prince; you had to have a good reason why not, you know. And um, and I related to that completely when he said that Prince is not the type was not the type of person who you could just say, well that that can't work. You you could never be dismissive, uh, 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 you know, with him. That uh, number right, one, right. if you're an employee, you're not supposed to in the first place. But right, right. it was never a simple. Uh, no, was never simple. Like you had to explain to him how come, why not? Mm -hmm. And Dave talks about this in his interview with Audrey saying that pretty much you're talking about somebody who believed in themselves and their own vision so forcefully that the immutable laws of physics were, were unsatisfactory to him. <laughs> right, right. You understand what I'm saying, Joe? Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Dave had to give a scientific explanation about why certain things couldn't happen, at least on Earth, you know. And he would approach the questioning from what I gleaned from the interview. He's like, well, Prince, that could be possible if gravity worked like this, you know, right. if, you know, the, uh, you know, <laughs> if physics didn't work in this particular way, it would be obtainable here in, in our environment on Earth. But until those things are available to us, uh, you know, it, it, I don't know of a way. 
Now, now with your experience, the longest <laughs> uh, member of Prince's entourage, you know, musical collaborators, you have the longest tenure through the years, right? That's what That's I heard what they keep time. saying, yeah. And I'm, I'll let them say that. You know, what I've learned is that, you know, you let people just, you know, there are people out there who, who think of this as one big contest. And right. you know what I mean? Like every yeah, time yeah. I look up, there's a poll, you know, right. I mean, e even though you know, in Prince's <laughs> interview with Chris Rock, he names me as the front runner. And, right, and right. I don't know if people just forgot about that. It's like, it, I I am the drummer he chose in his on, with his dream band. So, uh, you know, and, irrespective and that fraternity of how they feel of drummers about it, is Right, yeah, right. it's like they keep, you know, it's like, okay, all right. I just don't, I don't really engage. Prince said it himself. So I don't feel a need to, you know, to wave that flag. He waved it for me. So, I, yeah. you know, to me, the, the contest is over and done in that, in that department. There's nothing to discuss. Spe speaking of that interview with Chris Rock, I was outside. It was like a general admission, yeah, standing room. And I was freezing my ass out on the streets of New York, Roseland, waiting to get in. <laughs> but he was doing the interview. It was in January or February. Oh, boy. And he got in there, and it was, you know, I found out later he was doing the interview with Chris Rock. Sure. It, it was a great show. It was, um, you know, Roseland and everything. It was great. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it's, you know, that's the other thing I tell people. It's like, they were like, well, what do you think of his bands before or after? I'm like, listen, what I learned from working with Prince is that you got to be a bad person. You got to be bad. If you're right, going to hang right. with Prince, I don't care which band you, you were in, who came before me or after, uh, you had to have real talent and and uh, a real ability to uh, um, remember things, you know, like you had to have good recall. Like it's it wasn't just about how, ma how many chops you got, you know, it, it, it had to do with how, how quickly you can turn a result how quickly you can understand what's happening around you. Like your reflexes and your impulses all have to be in alignment. You got to almost, you know, it's like Prince always, <laughs> he would say this thing, like, you know, if I could clone myself, you know, right. I would just have a band of me, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I think he expected of all of us to really like almost um, uh, read his mind, really. You know, it. I don't know how else to put it. It's like you should know where this is going. You know, right. we there's you know uh, quantum entanglement exists. You are you know we are all you know operating on the same energy on the same axis. You know. Now let, let me ask you something. To all the concert tours and everything, we see Prince. You know, perfection all the time. But you know, of course, there's there's the miscues occasionally. I, and I was at Radio City when you were doing the act one tour and he did a, he took a fall during the, I think scandalous or insatiable took a slide on, on the okay. floor. And mm -hmm. when stuff like that happens the Prince, when you guys are reviewing the concert tape, does he make any comments on it or just lets it slide? Oh, he was, uh, you know, uh, he always had a pretty good sense of humor about himself. Right. Okay. That's you know, I don't, it wasn't like he, he would fast forward or anything, you know, Yeah. But you know, I, it, I mean, thinking back, I don't know if I would have noticed anyway. It's uh, yeah, yeah, right. And you're on stage. Yeah, it's just, I just, I mean, I noticed, I saw it happen, but it's not. I can't. It's like I can go Prince and jump off the drums and go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I he had to cover it. Great, he just popped right. You know, probably popped up into a split. Oh, it would happen from time to yeah. time. One time, I remember we were playing somewhere in Europe, and it was raining, and he came out. He did that thing where. You know, he's sliding on his heels, and he almost went off the front yeah. edge of the stage. You know, wow. I mean, he was, uh, it's funny, because um, in conversations in my mind with him sometimes that I have, uh, mm -hmm. he will he will tell me, like, you really, you know, you didn't take the time to enjoy the time that we had, you know, together. We had fun. We funked all over the planet. You know, right. yeah. and you were you were you were so reserved and 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 you know unwilling to just let yourself completely you know just go with it. And I'm explaining to him like that's that luxury is was always reserved for you. 
I had to be a good soldier. I couldn't be spontaneous or or uh, or um, uh, what's the word? Lackadaisical in my duties. I couldn't. I all I could do was focus on the job. I I have a lot of moments that I appreciate now that kind of come back to me, but in the moment, it's 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 there's failure is not an option. You know. When was the last time that uh, you were in contact with Prince before his passing? I did a, a recording session with him a, about a month before he passed. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was me. Oh, it was you and Sonny? No, it was oh. me and uh, Adrian Crutchfield was there. Oh, okay, on sax, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and Mono Neon was in the control room with Prince, and I never saw him, and I never got to speak to him. He doesn't speak too much, I heard. Uh, you got to ask Mono the right questions. Oh, okay, that's it. He's he's yeah. a lot like a friend of mine, uh, who I considered, uh, who I considered and consider, the world's greatest guitar player. His name was Jeffrey Lee Johnson. Oh yeah, mutual friend. Yeah, great guy. He was he was you know the end all be all in guitar players as far as uh, I, I'm concerned. Um, he uh, Mono was kind of a disciple of Jeff. I found out when we finally did talk, and. Oh, uh, wow. What happened was we were re rehearsing for the the XL Center tribute for Prince in October of 2016. Right. And um, Sonny, uh, actually Mono was playing in one of the configurations of the bands that were going to be performing. And one day he got there early and we were, we were rehearsing with Morris and Tommy. And uh, it was like it was early going in the rehearsals. And Mono was there, and uh, you know he seen that Sonny was already playing bass, so he he picked up a guitar, and right away I was like, mm, I recognize that sound, I recognize the sense of space. I, it, it was like that sound is the sound of somebody who studied Jeff Jeff Lee Johnson, and I asked him, I said, Do you listen to Jeff? And he just said, Yeah, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> like of course, who wouldn't? You know, and uh, I don't know if I've I don't know if I've told you the story, but uh, Jeff came up from Philly and he performed in the studio on my show uh, twice with him and Chico Huff and Ted Thomas. What? And uh, yeah, yeah, I've got the record. I got everything. I gotta I gotta send it to you. So that was the trio, man. Yeah, yeah, it was. And and sadly, Ted Thomas just passed away from COVID. What? I yeah. didn't even know. Yeah, that it is... happened. To, Few 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 months ago, yeah, very. Scary, that explains. Yeah. So I tried to I tried to message him on Facebook and then never got a response. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you look it up, maybe there was you see the obituary in Google or something. Yeah. All right, but, man. But, yeah, but the, the 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 you're talking about Jeff and everything. A man, a few words. You know, he, he walked in the studio with a big, large pizza for everybody. Just drove up from Philly with the guys. He's like, I brought pizza, and we went in the back room. And we were jumping between the two studios. We recorded in the back room the live stuff. And I said, do you want to do a sound check? He says, no, let's just play. Uh -huh. And he just went straight in. And the thing is, I couldn't do a sound check. And Ted had his full drum set in there. So he on the first song, he basically, it was a, the drummer got the solo. He, he was featured on the whole track. He was so loud. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, did, yeah, you, I got you, you even out the, the, the levels after a while. Oh yeah, yeah. After a while, but you know, they were they were laughing because he. I think he did the song. We oh, we had to do the songs first because he had to go into New York. He was the drummer with Admiral. Okay. So he he was rushed into the show, and and we went to see Jeff at the Knitting Factory in New York. It was a great show. Mm -hmm. Same guys were playing, and then I got home. The next day from work, and he left a message on my on my phone. He's like, I really appreciate you. Uh, inviting us up the studio he's really really thankful and everything but he goes i'm thinking of leaving the business he was you know he was like a torture genius yeah you know uh, i saw somebody recently i now i can't remember who it was i saw talking about this um like if if people keep oh it, they were talking about patrice o'neill it was uh, uh oh, yeah, i saw a documentary right? recently yeah the yeah. the yeah on, on comedy central right. and uh, they were talking uh, uh, about how he'd rather have somebody walk up to him and say, man, you suck, you know, 
than to say you're the you're the greatest comedian in the world. Right. You know, because his surroundings didn't look like that. Mm-hmm. Like he, you know, he led his life, but he didn't lead the life of like Eddie Murphy or somebody who, you know, had the the spoils of, you know, success. And I think part of that was was, you know, his unwillingness to play the game, you know? And that's fine. Some people are not made for the game. I get that. You know, Jeff Lee, similar situation. I, I saw people all the time walking up to him saying, you, you know, like you changed my life. You're the world's greatest guitar player. And he was like, yeah, tell my bank account that. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, literally, uh, there was a jazz festival in, in France and uh, I knew one of the guys who, who was there, who was working on the staff, and he talked about how Jeff Beck was just in awe of Jeffrey Lee Johnson. Wow. And, and you know, Jeff was kind of freaked out by it. Like, dude, you're Jeff Beck. I'm, I'm, I'm nobody in your universe, you know? Um, I also heard um, that um, when Jesse Johnson joined D'Angelo. Uh, okay. Jeff was, um, uh, he was working with, what's her name now? Uh, oh, um, yeah, Esperanza he, Spalding. That's right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if that affected the fact that he couldn't go out with D'Angelo at the time, or okay. yeah. in any case, they called Jeff and asked him to, to take the train up from Philly to kind of run the, run the book. With, while Jesse was there, so Jesse could, you know, kind of catch the vibe. Right. And um, and I heard that Jesse was like, why don't y'all just take this dude? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know. And Jesse, uh, Sonny and I did a trio gig with Jesse a couple years back. Okay. But, um, I mean, you're talking about a natural on guitar. Right. Mm-hmm. Jesse is he's born to do it, you know. Like really, like uh, our rehearsals were so intense because uh, Jesse just plays with this conviction and this. I mean, he's just an endless vocabulary. Um, just a just a uh, just a natural guitar player. His rhythm is so uh, so in the pocket, so funky. You know. Did you guys record anything as a trio? Uh, no, we did not. He had a new record he had just finished, okay. um, and. Uh, so it no it didn't lead to that it was a it was a i mean the the only you know part that was kind of uh uh odd was that you know we <laughs> we played a lot of stuff you know we had like 3 days of rehearsal for this gig and there was so much jamming going on that you know we the the workload really kind of suffered and we got to the gig and it was like what are we going to play well you know <laughs> We just played the blues in B flat for 30 minutes yesterday. You know, <laughs> like, are we going to do that here? You know? So uh, I wish we had taken more, t- we'd been more responsible, but Jesse was trying to get his chops together. You know, he hadn't been playing so much at the time. So we did what he needed to do to feel comfortable. So, you know, the gig came off all right. Um, and, uh, but uh, I guess I'm just saying like any, any guitar player could could appreciate what Jeffrey Lee Johnson uh, had to offer. Is all I'm really saying is that he was he was a guitar player, uh, you know, for guitar players. Right, know. right. But uh, yeah, but I also mean, could, but also could. I mean, he played with D'Angelo. He didn't didn't have to do all that. He would sit there on how does it uh, how does it feel and just play the beep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. He, he told me one one time he says uh, he was on like a major hit record, a number one record in the studio, and uh-huh. he, he was saying the the girl couldn't sing one bit. I, you know, they, they fixed her voice up and everything. He never said who it was, but uh, you know, I guess, I guess that side of the business, of course, didn't appeal to him too much. No, but it's, what's funny is that he did actually play on uh on a Mariah Carey record. He played on several tracks on the, Eman- is it the Emancipation of Mimi or whatever? Oh, okay. Oh, he was on that? Okay. <laughs> Jeff played on that. Randy Jackson hired him. And uh, I guess, you know, it was like, like Mariah was really like digging his style, you know? 
she was, you know, like they got to talking and then like, you know, some gopher or some handler came out and like, you know, spirited her away. But it was like, they really got along, like, you know. Um, so I think it really comes down to, to, you know, the fact that it is a, uh, it's a, it's a grab bag. You don't know how people are going to be, what kind of talent they really got, you know, till you get in the studio and, you know, it's a, it's, it's a complicated business, man. You know, and yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It just, I mean, in in respect to that, the the there's the uh, I I don't know if it, if it I don't know if I can even really verbalize what I'm trying to say. It's just that you have to balance all these things, you know. And it's, um, it's not like a normal job where you just go and you you know do your thing. You eat your cheese sandwich at noon, and right. you, you know. <laughs> it's not that it's like you we're dealing with tone and vibration and taste and you know there's so many subjective aspects to it um that uh you know it's hard to tell exactly what goes wrong when it doesn't work because there's the potential in every corner <laughs> right, right so i get you're, it you're, yeah you're yeah. your own uh, business enterprise as well right music business uh, yeah, I mean, really, yeah, Pretty you were kind of res- all your stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, I have an LLC, but you know, it's um, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's a complicated business to be in, and that's why I guess I've 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 poured water on so many people coming up to me trying to get lessons or get their kill the kids involved. I'm like, you don't know what you're asking for. This is not a life for anyone, mm-hmm. unless that kid's got the curse. He'll just shine it on and keep moving. And I'm like, you don't have to encourage musicians to, to play music. The, the, you don't need to encourage them. It will happen on their own. You know, like, how do I get my kid involved in music? Don't teach them how to how to how to do, you know, a, a mathematics. Teach them how to do, you know, teach them a viable skill, you know, that 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 has a predictable pathway. Because because this is not. Everybody ain't made to do what we do. Yeah. Well, you, you definitely, you know, since you were a young kid up till now and in your 50s, really just, you know, looking back and everything we've been talking about is, just, you know, I'm wowed by it, but it's it's just been your life and your passion, right? Yeah. I mean, I it's uh, it, without the curse. I mean, it's like, why do you give a drummer perfect pitch, God? Why did, why did you do that? Why do I need to have so much information, you know? It's, you read uh, music, or you just you go, you just play. Well, well I never really developed uh, my my reading chops so well because my ears tell oh, me yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. I I have perfect pitch. I don't need an instrument in front of me to tell you what notes you're playing wrong. Okay, <laughs> that's how deep it goes for me. Wow. But yeah, Bernie Worrell was like that. He told me. Yeah. Who's that? Bernie Bernie Worrell. I believe that by by yeah, how he, he played. Perfect, uh, yeah. Jeff Lee had perfect pitch. Sonny has perfect pitch. You know, it's a uh, there's 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 a few of us out there, and um, it, it's it's uh, it can be frustrating for us dealing with people who don't. Right. <laughs> you know, because uh, I hear music like most people see colors. I'm actually I'm actually colorblind with with a, a couple of different. A couple, a couple of different, um, like reds and greens, confuse me. Uh, oh wow! Certain browns. You still driving? Oh, I, man, I've never been. Uh, a dr- I, I don't drive. Oh really? Okay, I was just joking. Oh no, no, no! I don't. Oh, okay. I don't. <laughs> yeah, my wife I tried. You. Yeah, I tried once, man, but um, it's I was a, a danger on the road. <laughs> okay. And so I thought I'd, I, you know, I mean. I actually knew a guy who uh, drove drunk in high school and killed okay. everybody in the car but himself. Oh wow! And it changed his life in a in a bad way. And uh, I always thought to myself, I'd never want to be in that position. I'd rather go. You know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I have to live with all that pain. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, thank God I've never been in an actual like a car accident. You know, I, I've I've walked away from some dodgy flights in my life, right. you know. <laughs> so I've been kept. You know, I've been. You know, kept. I was uh, I was talking to 
not on air, but I was talking a couple months ago with, with your buddy Chance Howard, and he he really had a bad accident. He, oh Lord, yeah, I he, I didn't know how worked. bad until I talked to him. Sorry, go ahead though. Yeah, no, no, I think I think we probably talked to him about the same stuff, but yeah, he's he's working his way back from some serious injuries, and he just says he was overtired and coast to coast, and he was another musician still plays at the club, and just fell asleep. He said. Yeah, he said it was. He fell asleep eighty feet away from his house. Oh wow! He had. Yeah. He had. I think he had done a, a, a double nighter in Chicago, and then had two gigs back to back at the Dakota Jazz Club here in Minneapolis. Right. And I think he said it was at the end of the first night. He just fell asleep at the wheel. He just he right. over, over, he just overly exhausted himself, and. uh you know, uh, it's that's you know, it's an extension of 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 the drive. You know, right. Chance Howard is brilliant. Mm-hmm. He's he's one of the best musicians I've ever known. He's a great singer. I mean, for Prince to just turn him loose on the musicology tour and just go ahead, man. Yeah, go ahead, Big Papa. Go ahead, let him have it. You know, right. right. That's saying a lot because you know Prince could be generous, but he could also be very greedy about the spotlight. Right, right. You had to be bad to, to for Prince to turn turn loose that light to, for you to get a little. I mean, right. with Rosie, that was the first time anybody saw him really do it. Like she got, and I'm not saying anything negative about Bonnie Boyer. I thought she was tremendous, but right. she Prince never let her just go straight off. Like yeah. Rosie, just man, our first gig, uh, which was in I think maybe Rotterdam. Or it, it might have been at the Ahoy. I can't remember, but it was like in Holland, and I mean, we stepped out on stage. People already had signs like "We love Rosie." <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> like, they just—I mean, I, I mean, I guess just from um, uh, New Power Generation, I think had been released as a single. Oh, okay. And she was singing on that. And right, uh, right. so I think they, I think her credit was vocal icing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so they already knew about Rosie. We got there and they were going crazy for Rosie, you know? So how is she doing? Have you, have you kept in contact? I have not spoken to her in, in many years, but I have been okay. in contact with her daughter a bit. And, okay. uh, you know, uh, I, I haven't heard any, any, any bad news as of late. So I presume she's. Yeah, okay, that's good relatively stable and just trying to do her thing. Right, right. You know? Yeah. So many people miss her. I mean Yeah, you know, it's a it's a Yeah, I, I miss her a, a lot. She was she right. was uh like really one of the people I hung out with the most like back in the day. Like we right, just right. you know, like me, her and Sonny, we spent a lot of time together. 